from Kansas State, number 18, Will Howard. Oh man, it just it brings a, a smile to my face and a, a flicker in my eye getting to to watch that run over and over again. Will Howard busting in the end zone and having to hear the sad KUPA announcer, Will Howard touchdown. Oh man, it's the best. It is the best feeling in the world. Uh, still riding high after after getting to see all those losers walk out of David Booth Memorial Stadium one last time before they tear down and blow up that decrepit place that sucks and is full of misery and losing. And it got to close out with another K-State win. Just a beautiful, beautiful scene last week after the game. Like I've said, this first 60 minutes uh, of that evening from 7 to whenever the game ended, not very fun, very stressful, very everything, not enjoyable. But uh, everything in the aftermath has been great, and uh, there's still a year to kind of bask in that that fun of being able to get another one over on Kansas we can do that as K-Staters hopefully the Wildcats are not doing that they've got Iowa State this week that is the matchup this Saturday seven o'clock so welcome into the KSO show I'm Mason Voth that is Derek Young both of us from K-State Online and on three as we get ready to preview the Wildcats and the Cyclones Farmageddon to close out the 2023 regular season uh, D.Y., I'll open it up with uh, this question to you. What is the expectation for K-State's chances to bounce back after a pretty big-time win against KU last weekend? I think it's going to be hard. They obviously really enjoyed that win over KU, and to recover from that kind of emotional high is not the easiest thing to do. Now you add in the fact that K-State and Iowa State typically always playing close games. I think since I've covered the team, really the only one that wasn't was during the COVID year. And you kind of throw that one, you know, out into the trash, so to speak. And then you got to think about just the way these two teams play. It's probably conducive to a tight, low possession game. And then the weather on top of it's probably going to contribute to that as well. So, look, you know, spoiler alert, we're off the top of the show. But I think this game's going to be closer than a lot of people think. Mm, mm. Well, I don't I don't like to hear that. Uh I have tricked myself into disagreeing with the fact that it's going to be close, even though I have years upon years of experience to look at and see that this game, no matter what teams are and what they aren't, ends up being a close game. But uh, even, I choose not to believe it. Even last year was 10-9, to and that Iowa State team went 1-8 and in the Big 12. Yeah, I, uh, last year's game, that was... Well, uh, tough to tough to quantify what went down with that. Now it could have been a little bit more. Well, I mean, Malik Knowles did have a big one yard line, Malik, but yeah, Malik Knowles drops the ball or the drop. He fumbled it, but um, whew. yeah, you look back now and you say they beat Iowa State, a one and eight Big Twelve Iowa State team by just one point last year, and it's pretty easy to kind of squint and see this one being pretty tight as well. Yeah, it. <sighs> It, last year's game just it'll it'll blow your mind looking at it and and how that ended it's, up playing in real out. time. We didn't know that because that was a little bit earlier in the season, I think, or at least earlier enough to say maybe Iowa State's not terrible, and we didn't know Kansas State was going to win the Big Twelve. Yeah, yeah, Iowa State was zero and two going into that game, and they had lost by a touchdown against a top twenty Baylor team, and they lost by a field goal in that ugly game in Lawrence. Um, and really, I mean, that was. Look at this stretch last year for Iowa State, looking back on it. They lose by a touchdown to Baylor, who was number 17 at the time. The three-point loss at KU, we know that was kind of a weird game. They lose by a, a point to K-State, and they lost by three at Texas, a game that they should have won. It, it looked like Xavier Hutchinson was giving the game away to Texas there. Uh, they only had two games last season that – well, they had three games last season that were decided by more than one score in the Big 12. They were a loss at Oklahoma, 27 to 13, I guess at home against Oklahoma, but 27 to 13, a 17 point win against West Virginia, and a 62 to 14 loss at TCU to end the regular season. Uh, everything else was within a score. They lost 14 10 to Texas Tech, 20 to 14 to Oklahoma State, and I mentioned the other ones already. So this team played a lot of tight games last year, has a lot to do with the fact that they might have had one of the best defenses that the Big 12 has seen in a long time. And it got squandered because offensively they were just so bad. And honestly, you know, the gambling thing, they they talked about it a lot. They were upset about it. 
thank God for the gambling scandal if you're in Ames, Iowa, because Hunter Deckers didn't have to be your quarterback this season. Rocco Becht has come in, and he's played just fine. He broke Brock Purdy's freshman touchdown pass record at Iowa State already this year. Uh, they Not that they've been amazing on offense, but they're certainly better than what they were last year. And you can point to the offense as being the sole reason why Iowa State was a bad football team last season. Yeah, here, here's a funny way to look at it, um, just because it kind of goes against everything that I've already said. But last year, Iowa State was probably a lot better than the record indicated just because of all those close games. And this year, they may be just what the record indicates or maybe a little less even because mm -hmm. they're sitting there six and five and you kind of look at what they've done to get to six and five and you're like, I don't know what they have done. Their best win was against Oklahoma State at home before the Cowboys got good or turned it around. That was before Oklahoma State had that bye week that resurrected their season. So you look beyond that. So if you throw that game out, Iowa State didn't have a good win. They don't have one good win. And the the, the thing I, that I remember the most, and look, it ended up being a one-score game. But they hosted KU in a night game and never really threatened the Jayhawks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had a little sliver of a chance there at one point, but they didn't capitalize on it. They blew it kind of instantly. And kind of the same deal with Texas. They had some opportunities in that game, but they just kind of let them slip away. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what comes about everything this weekend for the Cats and the Clones. 7 o'clock kick on Fox. Cats uh, started as 9.5-point favorites. I think it's up to 10 now for the Cats uh, because, look, they've been really good at home this season against – teams that are inferior that's really been the only type of home opponent that they've had this year uh what is the expectation for how k-state handles this game you say it's going to be close why is it that this game ends up being close other than just hey this is always traditionally a tight one yeah and i think the look ahead line last week you could have got it at 13 and a half i think um i think it was there at one point i think it's close because i don't think there's going to be a ton of possessions because i think the weather is going to play a role. And when a weather plays a role and you have two teams that are built like these two teams, you tend to have less possessions because you're probably going to run more clock. Um, so it, th that's just a lot of it. The amount of possessions, it could look similarly to KU game from a possession standpoint and from a stylistic standpoint as well, to be quite honest. And at the end of the day, the Cyclones are an above 500 team that typically gives it their best when they play Kansas State. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. What What do you think K-State can do against this Iowa State team? I mean, last week, there were some struggles for K-State. The defense was not really able to impose their will. Um, they just kind of had to play a, a game where, all right, we're going to have to feel this out, see what we can get, and just pick our spots. There was no dominance from the K-State defense last week, and the offense had moments where it looked like what we would have expected going into that game. I mean, that first drive, you instantly thought, oh, this is gonna this is gonna be easy again. K State is going to do what we normally expect them to do against Kansas. Things kind of cooled off. They got things figured out though, and they were able to get scores when they absolutely had to have them, which was a significant deal. Uh, what is it against Iowa State that K State fans should expect the Wildcats to be able to accomplish successfully, no matter what happens in this game? I would think that they can defend a pass pretty well. Rocco has been pretty solid this year, but at the same time, Kansas State is a, you know, a respectable pass defense, and it's going to be conditions that might not be conducive to that. What I will say is Iowa State does not run the ball very well. Now they're on an upswing a little bit because Abu Salma has had a couple of good games, but they haven't ran the ball well in total this year. Kansas State doesn't have a great rush defense this year when you kind of look at the numbers, especially Big 12-only games. And I think it's only gotten worse the last couple of weeks. And obviously a contributing factor to that is not having Jay Clifton or Daniel Green at the inside and being thrusted to play a true freshman and a walk-on at that spot that is the anchor for a rush defense. And you don't know the availability of Nose Guard, who's supposed to say them all as well. So you kind of worry, even though Iowa State hasn't been great running the ball, Kansas State's no longer structured too well to defend the run. And another thing, Kansas State's feasted on turnovers. That's kind of been the calling card for the defense in the last six games. Guess what? Like Kansas State, Iowa State doesn't turn it over. They take care of the ball. The Cyclones are really good at that. 
Kansas State's really good at or taking care of the ball. Uh, Will Howard did throw an interception last week, but you kind of go back and look at the film of that particular play. Um, he had a guy literally tackled. So a uh, bad PI call that was missed on, on that play that probably would have negated the turnover. So uh, I think Kansas State will be able to take care of the ball. I think Iowa State's going to be able to take care of the ball as well if it holds suit to how they have performed, you know, in the last six, seven, maybe even eight games. Uh, their run game, not great, but Kansas State's not great stopping the run at the moment. And they're probably, you know, trending towards the wrong way on that. But you think you can defend the pass against the Cyclones. Now, Kansas State's offense, look, Iowa State's defense is still very good. That's that's what they will always be under John Haycock, uh, the defensive coordinator, <laughs> coordinator. That's kind of been the calling card for Matt Campbell teams in Ames. That hasn't changed. They're a little bit more vulnerable than they typically have been. They're not as spectacular on that side of the ball as they were last year. They're still very, very good. They just don't really have a pass rush at the moment. You know, it's kind of interesting to think about. We we were worried so much at different points this season about K-State and turnovers. Um, they've moved themselves into a position okay. where they're they're now tied for third in the Big 12 in interceptions this season. And, and if you look around, they've recovered eight fumbles this year, which – puts them inside of like the top 10 nationally in fumble recoveries this season. So they're doing a good thing. And, and K-State and Iowa State, uh, they end up being in the same spot. Uh, they're 11th in the country in terms of turnover margin at nine this year. K-State's forced 20 turnovers. Iowa State's forced 18. The Cats with just a couple more giveaways, though, uh, like you kind of alluded to there. Kansas State top 10 in the country in turnover margin now, I believe. Yeah, it's – uh. They they figured it out, and Chris Kleiman talked about it after the Oklahoma State game. I think a lot of people were wanting to put it on uh, Will Howard and the mistakes there. And look, there's no doubt that he deserves some serious critiques for how that game played out. Three turnovers is inexcusable, but Chris Kleiman was also right that the defense needed to step up and force some of their own. And we've seen over the last couple of weeks they finally started to do it and do it in critical moments, and that's given K State an opportunity to go out and uh, kind of continue on and get the opportunity to win. So talking about the things that will work for K-State, um, I'm with you. You would think that the the run game isn't as big of a concern, but Abu Sama has come on. He had the massive game at BYU. It's actually the first game all season that Iowa State had a 100-yard rusher in. Everybody does that to BYU, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, true. Yes, true. Yeah, and, and that game came pretty easy to the Cyclones there. But you, you would think that the run game lacking K-State – might be able to have a better opportunity there. Although, how much how much does Iowa State look at what KU did last week and try to try to install or put any of that into their offense for this week against K State because it was effective. K State struggled with it. Yeah, I don't think uh, the gimmicks necessarily with the quarterback in motion and uh, line up a receiver. I don't think you'll see a ton of that just because that's not who they are. If you try to be that, and sometimes that gets you into trouble. I would say the game plan is something that they may mimic. Um, just running the ball and, uh, you know, building a, uh, I guess, sequence of plays each drive that is long extended plays where you're keeping the Kansas State offense off the field. Because like KU, Iowa State's route to a win here is probably a limited possession game. So I would imagine that their game plan is similar, maybe not the play structures um, in terms of using all those weird uh, – motion shifts and stuff that KU did, uh, especially with uh, being undermanned at, at quarterback. What do you expect uh, for K-State to maybe struggle with in this game from an offensive or defensive standpoint? Where, where are they vulnerable? Where could Iowa State make up the margins that you think make this a close game? Yeah, it, it's if Iowa State continues to take care of the ball like they have. like that. I think that's significant, and it's if – Iowa State's able to run the ball. Now, they haven't been able to much this year, but like you said about Abu Sama starting to come on a little bit, and Kansas State is just depleted at the wrong spots when it comes to having a good run defense. Well, that that's true, and we saw last week, I mean, the struggles that K-State went through. Chris Kleiman talked about, hey, we – we had to make the switch. Like Bo Palmer got uh, a majority of the run late in the game at, at linebacker because Austin Romain, just the lack of experience kind of crushed him there. And Bo Palmer did a pretty nice job of filling in. Uh, I think if I think if you go and look at it, maybe it's changed if they've updated it during the week. But I think uh, the day after 
Bo Palmer ended up with the highest PFF grade on the defense this week for K-State. Um, so there, Bo- there were high thoughts there. And he, he stepped in and did his thing. And he, and he made some splash plays, too. It wasn't just like, oh, you didn't know, make you know plays where you were noticeably bad. He, he made some big plays for him. Yeah, he batted a ball down at the line of scrimmage. I think he had the tip on the Kobe Savage mm-hmm. interception. He had a real brutal physical tackle that really set a tone as well. And I think he forced a fumble, I want to say. Yeah, I don't know who forced the fumble, but he had a sack, I'm pretty sure. Or at least yeah, a, yeah. a tackle behind the line of scrimmage. A little weird there on some of the, the KU stuff because some of them just look like runs. But uh, yeah. he he stepped up and, and made his presence felt in that game, and, and that was significant for K-State to have a guy to be able to step up like that. And speaking of PFF, you want to flip it over to the other side of the ball. Not that it's gospel, but Carver Willis was the highest-graded run blocker and pass blocker for Kansas State. And as a whole – Look at some of those PFF numbers. The Kansas State offensive line got some really high grades, and they, and like you're saying, they got it from guys that had struggled at points this year. Like that, that was one of the things that I I took away most notably from the game was you had guys step up and probably play their best games of the season. I and mean, your guy, your guy, Marquis Siegel, finally caught a ball. Yeah, well, look, you know, you, you finally catch a ball, he's, good he's, things happen. It sounds like we're ta- we're taking shots at Marquis Siegel. We're not. He's played really good this year, and it would be great for Kansas State if he came back because he does have more eligibility. Yeah, look, I the they're not. It's not taking shots at Marquis Siegel. Everybody that's listening to this knows that I have an affinity for him. That man has been in the right position to make plays time and time again this season. It's just he had had the stone hands and bounced right off, but he finally plays was defense coming down. for a reason. Plays defense for a yeah, reason. Exactly. Yeah, I can I can hear Kirk Herbstreit saying that on NCAA 13 right now or something. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, you talked about Carver Willis offensively and his PFF grade. Cooper Beebe was good as always. Now, I will say the one thing that uh, Cooper Beebe was better in this week, according to PFF, than what he gets credit for throughout the season was his run blocking. Which you know, K State we we know did a good job there. But Hayden Gillum was a top five uh, offensive grade getter, and PFF that's you know a rarity at times. So I thought a lot of those guys stepped up, and obviously we know that those guys did the best job that they could on that last drive for K State to hold the ball for five and a half minutes. I I like what Drew said about it, where he just said, "Hey, this is a legacy drive for for the beef," and they came through on that one, and uh, they they showed up for K State last week. So. That's a, a pretty significant deal, I would say. So Yeah, I think right before that drive uh, started in our group chat, I think I said championship drive incoming, and they, they put the they put it on them and they got it. Yep, they did. They came through. It was a big deal. Uh, all right, well, let's, uh, let's roll on here. One interesting thing about this game for K-State, they get to deal with all the, the fun and circumstance of senior day, I guess senior night since it's going to be at 7 o'clock. Um, what do you make of the senior class? I know Chris Kleiman talked about it a little bit yesterday. And then obviously there are questions about who comes back. How is that going to go down? Who should come back? You are obviously already mentioned Marquis Siegel. Uh, just give wherever you want to go on this senior class for K-State and uh, what you expect for the rest of the season next year and their overall importance in the history of K-State football. Well, very important. Um, cause a lot of these guys were here when they won the big 12 last season. And, and that's no small feat at Kansas state, you know, conference titles should be celebrated. And if you get one, you're in pretty good company at this point, um, in Kansas state, you know, we're talking about legacies, even you could say that. And, you know, if things shake, right, maybe they appear in two consecutive, a few of these guys, which would be pretty, and that is rare, but I don't think it's happened. Right. So, um, that would be phenomenal for these kids. Look, especially the ones that were here for four or five years, um, they probably are one tired, <laughs> but two, uh, tough because they went through, you know, a season or two that that was pretty challenging and that's not to feel sorry for them or anything, but, you know, guys that had to start their careers with like a COVID season, that's, mm-hmm. that's pretty rough. And to come out on the other end of it and have a Big 12 title, maybe a shot at a second one. Um, and to be honest, you you look at it, a lot of wins, especially the last three years. Like this is a, you know, other than than some of those late runs in the the late 90s and early 2000s, this three-year run that Kansas State's on 21, 22, 23, you're talking about perhaps back-to-back 10-win seasons, another one with 
what eight or nine. So it's it's a team in a in a group that's been together for a lot of wins. Yeah, I I think the the most notable thing is that a lot of these guys that that are going to be seniors, you know, tomorrow or on Saturday night, you look at them, they they were freshmen in the COVID year, and I, I just think about like how wild and weird of an experience that would be. I mean, like think about it this way: that you you have already a very different life experience for the first time for everybody else. So for even regular students, like my brother was a freshman in college in 2020, like. That had to have been the strangest thing ever to start this totally new foreign concept to you, and you're doing it in a totally different ordeal than what anybody else has to. It's more restricted. There's all this other stuff. Then you throw on top of it, these, these guys are doing it during a college football season, and that's a totally new grind for them. Like, yeah, they've played football before. Football has been their life, but it hasn't been their life like it becomes when you start playing Power 5 football. And they they went through that. And you think of a guy like Will Howard, who was thrust into action, what, game number three of that yes. season? Uncomfortable, it, disappointing, uh, probably because you're not getting the college experience that you've wanted or that you imagined. You didn't get spring football and you didn't get summer fo- the summer prep either because mm-hmm. that was still, I think they shut it down at that point. And then even fall camp and practices, I met. Like there were so much restrictions, those aren't regular either. So you, you didn't get the development that you would normally get. Yeah, just a a, a strange deal. And uh, look, I you know this is this is an important class, like you stated, and for them to come through, and a lot of those guys did on the on a Big Twelve title team is significant. Uh, more specifically, Will Howard, it, the, this very well uh, could be his last game at, at K State. Well, you know, in Manhattan, he'll he'll play the bowl game. Um, is that, would that be your expectation? Because that's certainly mine. That this is the the right type of ending for Will Howard, and you know, I, I think there's a mutual understanding of what the situation is next year. And honestly, like Will Howard has played well enough since that Oklahoma State game to be right back in the spot that we thought before the season, where he could you know throw himself into the NFL draft and he could he could latch on with the team. I mean, look, he he's a more talented quarterback with the size than what I think Skylar Thompson was, and I like Skylar and. He, here he is, you know, year two on the Dolphins roster. Uh, what do you make of the Will Howard situation moving forward? Because I know that there are a lot of people that uh, probably need their nerves to be settled down a l- little because they're just dying with anticipation about Avery Johnson and uh, not wanting to deal with the drama that could be if Will Howard came back for another year. One, I think Avery Johnson's happy so uh, and, and ready for next year, so I wouldn't worry about that. And I think that the entire – his his family and supporting cast are are all on board, and I like you. I think there's a mutual understanding there. Look, part of it is a, I doubt Will Howard would want to sign up for another year of that. You could tell yeah. that the two quarterback system wasn't necessarily something that he wanted to be in. He likes Avery; they're really close, pretty good friends. But I just don't. Will Howard wants in a situation where he's a certain starter, at least at the college level. He comes back next year, he's looking over his shoulder again. I don't think he would want that either. So I think there's a, a mutual understanding, and and I think both sides are going to be great and, and feel good about what, what's happening on, you know, moving forward. Whether And I don't know what that is for Will Howard moving forward, but I don't, you know, I don't think that he'll come back to Kansas State. I, I think this is his one song in Bill Snyder Family Stadium, and I think he's totally okay with that as well. Yeah, I think another thing that that would highlight that is uh, there are a couple of juniors that are going to walk on senior day. We we expect uh, one of them to be Ben Sennett, who already has accepted his senior bowl invite. Uh, so Ben Sennett will, will be out there and likely playing his last game at, at K-State, at least at home as well. Uh, and that, I mean, that the rise of Ben Sennett came on quick. He didn't catch a touchdown until the Baylor game last season, and then he instantly became the top target for Will Howard, has been impressive, made a lot of crucial plays for K-State over the last year now that have led to a Big 12 title and what could possibly be another 10-win season. Yeah, and he's really good. He deserves it as well. And and it, like you said, it's came on quick. It's kind of in a short tenure, short stint, and he's still close to breaking some school tight end records. So it tells you how good he is. And that's just another layer of it, right? Uh, Will Howard is really close with some of these guys like Ben Sinnott, like Hayden Gillum, guys that are going to move on. So I, I would imagine – he moves along with them. Uh, the last the last guy to, to specifically spot out here uh, with the, the senior stuff would be Cooper Beebe, who 
I mean, K-State's had a lot of good offensive linemen. There's an argument to be had that he he could be the best that K-State's ever had. Uh, it's been an impressive four years, and I know that there's a lot of talk about, you know, could an offensive lineman end up in the ring of honor? If there was a guy that was deserving of that honor, it would certainly be uh, Cooper Beebe. So what have you made of the last four seasons that K-State's gotten out of Cooper Beebe, a under-recruited defensive tackle from Kansas City? Uh, I think you said it best, and, and there's, he's probably going to become, what, a two-time Big 12 offensive lineman of the year, or, or at least damn near to it. If he doesn't, it's probably um, not the right call. So I think he should get it. Um, would it be three-time all Big 12? I believe so. I would I would assume so. I, if, if not, then the Big 12 screwed up in 2021. Yeah, I was just wondering he might have got it in 20, but I maybe not. So <laughs> he's going to be a uh, Well, time. look, he he was first team academic all Big 12 in 2020 DY, so we know, come on. That that's yeah. just as good as a, an on-field award. I'm joking about that people. Not a shot at Cooper Beebe for being smart, just I don't <laughs> care about academics and football, please. Three time first team all Big 12. I think what it'll he's going to be an All-American again most likely. Yep. And I think that'll make him a two-time All-American, I believe. Mm-hmm. Two-time Big 12 Offensive Lineman of the Year. Um, another shitty thing was that he didn't get in the Lombardi Award finalist, but they put in Brock Bowers for some reason. <laughs> so um, that was pretty BS, too. But, you know, you take those accolades into account. He's barely given up a sack. I think he's given up, like, three sacks his entire career, and two of them were the first game he played. So um, just an outstanding, phenomenal football player um, that loves Kansas State to death. Uh, you know, Ring of Honor, yeah, he, not many guys have the accolades that he does and are not up there. So I would put that into discussion the next time it happens. But I know there's other offensive linemen that are also worthy. I think when you're talking about accolades, I think Nick Lecky um, mm-hmm. is probably the one that has the biggest argument. And then it would be, or him and Cooper BB probably won a one B in terms of accolades in a in a body of work. Maybe we just end up one of these years when they're doing the Ring of Honor, they just have an all offensive lineman yeah. class. But, you yeah, because you what you could add with Lecky, BB, Cody Whitehair. There's, I mean, it's a long list. I don't want to start naming names and leave anybody out to to you know offend anybody because there are probably a lot of guys that look at it and like ah, I should be up there. What what's going on? I mean. Sean Snyder's up there. Why am I not up there? Uh, look, that honestly to me is the biggest. Um, no, I'm not going to get into it. I already took shots at Sean Snyder this week on the show. I did get positive texts about it, though. Uh, so what if it was from my uncle? But uh, no, it was. Uh, I, I, I won't victimize Sean Snyder even more, even if he is a Jayhawk loser. So that's uh, just, you know, how that goes. All right, uh, let's move on. We'll take a pause from the Iowa State K State conversation. Uh, let's dive into our best bets for the week, D.Y. Uh, last week, uh, the way things played out, uh, let me flash them up real quick. Uh, sorry, folks, but uh, there, there's been a little bit of a graphics rebrand, brand, so you're going to have to uh, revert back for a second. But uh, I had a, I had an almost good week. I went 2-1, and one, and uh, I think you went 2-1 and one as well, D.Y., so uh, good the week. Red Ra- the Red Raiders, <laughs> a one-point win. I would have thought they won by three touchdowns. Um, but no, they couldn't pull away from UCF. Otherwise, it, it would have been a perfect week. All right. The Sunflower uh, Showdown under 17 and a half largest lead yeah. was the biggest. That was the biggest lock of the week. Yeah, that was an easy one. At KU came the closest to having the, the biggest lead in the game. With 11, uh, yeah. All right. There is uh, There are the picks for this week. I'll let you rattle off yours first and give the logic behind them. Uh, UCF minus 13 and a half over Houston. Look, UCF's pl- kind of playing pretty good football right now. They gave Texas Tech. All they wanted, they dominated Oklahoma State. That's a team that I think is rising and ascending a little bit. And let's face it, Houston is – you never know what you're going to get with Houston, but it felt like they had their balloon popped last week when they had Oklahoma State on the ropes and couldn't finish Mm -hmm. it. So I think that – I think that's a good bet, although it's like the they're doing space wars because it's like Houston and UCF. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. Good call. Space wars there. Rutgers plus one. I – I don't really love Rutgers. I think this is a weird line that they're only a one-point dog against Maryland, who has played pretty good football for most of the season. So the line's a little stinky. Except against and, Illinois. Yeah. So the line's a little stinky, except Maryland's coming off where they're probably 
emotionally spent because they thought they had Michigan on the ropes last week. So I think this is probably a good spot to take Rutgers, uh, especially when you consider that you probably thought the line would be bigger, smells a little bit. And then, unfortunately, I got the clones plus 10. I've kind of, you know, give the spoiler alert a little bit, but this is a spot where the weather, the style of football, the pace, um, and the rivalry, I think, contributes to a one-score game. All right, well, uh, I was going to do something different for the case at Iowa State game, and then I saw you at Iowa State plus 10. So this is, <laughs> this is a big screw you and middle finger. I took the Cats minus 10 uh, in, in, in my pick this week, and we're just going to – you know, see who who the, who the better man is this week with the pick. Uh, look, I think it could be a close game. I'm not, you know, but I, I do think that the the opportunity for K State to have one of their more comfortable wins in uh, the history of this series recently is is there because it's a home game because Iowa State is kind of fading, and we know that that K State is is playing good football right now. So give me the Cats minus ten. Uh, the other one, uh, look, Thanksgiving night. Give me Ole Miss. Minus 10. Love the Egg Bowl. Love Look, the Egg Bowl. Love that it's back on Thanksgiving, too. It's 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 always kind of a disgusting game. I don't think we've ever seen a pretty Egg Bowl be played since it's uh, been moved back to, to Thanksgiving night. But I will say this, like Mississippi State, and you know how I, I've operated this year. If you fire a coach or if scandal strikes, I'm betting against you. Um, I know this game, I mean, it could be like 17 to 12 or something late Michigan, in the game. Though. No, that's true, uh, and I, I maybe should have last week against Maryland, but uh, look, I think Ole Miss probably wins this one. They, they, sh- they should be able to handle Mississippi State. They just fired their coach. They're in disarray. The season's a wash down there. Uh, Ole Miss minus 10. It's one of my favorite rivalries, and I, and I love that it's back on Thanksgiving. Remember the uh, touchdown celebration of the dog peeing? Yes, yeah, we've had multiple dogs lost being the game celebrations. That lost the game because of that. Yeah, that that's an all timer right there, and that was one. The second you knew it got flagged, you're like, this this kicker is missing it. There is no way. Like this is how the game works. Uh, my my last pick then right there in the middle. Uh, I'm taking Iowa plus two at Nebraska on Friday. Look, we think Nebraska is going to be able to score against this Iowa defense. It's weird that Nebraska is the favorite, right? Very strange. Uh, I figured I would just play it safe and take Iowa plus two. I think they win the game because I'm rooting hard for Iowa, even though I hate them. I think they're frauds. Um, look, Nebraska is sitting at five and six. They were five and three. It would be very comical to watch them lose like four to two and not make it to a bowl game. So give me the Hawkeyes plus two this weekend against Nebraska in Lincoln. And the, I got a nice little Thursday, Friday, Saturday pick going for you there i so. like that no i like that hey i always bring this up i will won a game i believe in the early 2000s against penn state six to four um this this that's on the table this week i think yeah uh look i i've got it pulled up right here six four uh this was uh, played on uh october 23rd of 2004 and yeah uh iowa state or iowa had leads of three to two and six to two and then uh, a safe. I, I mean, amazing that you could end up with two safeties in the game. I think they took the second one on purpose, probably, but I'm not sure. They may have, except it happened with eight over eight minutes left in the game. So that's what <laughs> makes me think, were they, like they just couldn't move the ball and they were in a bad spot. But that that is wildly impressive. If so, there's a uh, team that's going to take a safety on purpose with eight minutes left, it's Iowa. That is very true. That is uh, very, very true. All right, let's move on. Big 12 scoreboard time. Take a look at what's going on around the Big 12 this weekend. We know that there are a lot of other games out there uh, that that could mean something to K-State. The likelihood of them meaning something by Saturday night seems very small because K-State needs Texas to lose or Oklahoma and Oklahoma State to lose. That combo gets them in it would appear the big 12 doesn't really know though i mean they said yeah you know if texas does lose friday night we've got a whole new wave of scenarios that could play out for you on saturday that's important to point out so they they gave the the most obvious scenarios like Kansas state's in if oklahoma and oklahoma state both lose and then at the end it said and if texas loses they basically shrugged yeah who the hell knows? <laughs> the Big 12 has just bungled this thing unimaginable. I will, say, I will say a Texas loss I don't think is good enough. I think I think a Texas loss to Texas Tech or to Iowa State last week would have been good enough. But since the losses to Texas Tech, I believe Kansas State would need some more help on top of a Texas mm. loss. Well, let's uh, let's 
let's just knows? hope for the best and see uh, that something wild happens. Well, uh, you here. know, here's a good way to tackle the Big Twelve scoreboard this week. So Texas, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. Who's most likely to lose? Uh I think it's Oklahoma. Man, I don't know. Because honestly, series, honestly, I think it's. Everybody. I think I would say Texas. I just, I have. I think that there's. I think there's a better opportunity for the like whatever star power there is and talent on Texas Tech's roster to rise up to the occasion. I just think TCU really sucks, and I think going on the road. Uh, day after Thanksgiving in Norman, I, I just don't think they're going to be able to do it. I know Oklahoma could screw things up, and I guess if Jackson I, Arnold's going, you're hoping that you know young and experienced yeah. wins out. But. I pick I pick Oklahoma most likely to lose because I think they're the team that of the three you trust the least. Yeah. All right. Here is the rest of the Big Twelve this week: TCU, Oklahoma, 11 a.m. the Friday after Thanksgiving. Uh, they will go on Fox, and then uh, Friday night, Texas Tech at Texas, 6:30 kick on ABC, and then the I, rest of the games get played on Saturday. What I will say with the Texas Tech-Texas thing, the Red Raiders love that game more than anyone. So mm-hmm. I, I get where you're coming from, and they do have enough talent and have seemed to kind of turn a corner a little bit. I just don't love the matchup because Texas Tech, whenever they've had success this year, it's because they've been able to run the ball. That's kind of their bread and butter. Um, is it Tosh Brooks at running back, right? Mm-hmm. So, But guess what? No team can run on Texas. Yeah, that is that is the truth. Uh, 11 a.m. FS1, Houston UCF. We know where D.Y. is going with that one. I side with him. BYU has to go to Oklahoma State at 2.30. Uh, I don't think Oklahoma State's going to screw this up at home. They've come no. through in these spots in the past. Um, so I, I'm not banking on Oklahoma State dropping a game to help the Wildcats. And then uh, a, a trio of late games, West Virginia at Baylor, And then Cincinnati at KU and Iowa State at K-State. Yeah, those last two, some very clear, and I've got that flipped around. KU is at Cincinnati. KU should not be listed as the home team there. But um, West Virginia and KU both need these wins on the road to get to eight-win seasons, which would be significant for them. Uh, Who has the better chance of losing out of KU and West Virginia this weekend in uh, notable Big 12 road trips? That's tough. (laughs) That's That's a good question. I will I will say KU because it's a tricky spot for them. They're going on the road after having their hearts ripped out. So I think yeah. it's KU. And Cincinnati has played everybody except for Iowa State close at home this year, even Oklahoma. So yeah. uh, um, Cincinnati can be frisky. Their offense just sucks. I agree with you on Oklahoma State, BYU, because when BYU has threatened teams this year, I, you know, maybe I'm recalling wrong. Most of the time it's when BYU is the home team, it feels mm-hmm. like. Yeah, BYU. I don't like BYU on the road there. And then I, I also wanted to give a round of applause to Baylor. You're, I think it's because your games, there's games across Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, some more TV slots, <laughs> but you're not on ESPN Plus this week. Yeah, I'm going to have to write something different for power rankings this week. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do, but they are finally off of ESPN Plus. Uh, let, let me look real quick. First time since, uh, let's see. So when would their last. Non ESPN Plus game have been. Uh, this is their first non ESPN Plus game since October seventh, when they lost by twenty five to Texas Tech. So hats off to uh, the Bears and now, Jake Miranda. Last game of the year, senior night or senior yeah senior night. I don't think West Virginia is like good enough to just blow the doors off of anyone that they play. So I could see the Bears keeping it tight. I just don't think they're going to win. All right, let's uh, focus back on K-State and Iowa State. MVPs and prediction time for the Cats and the Clones. Uh, If the Cats come out victorious, who are you taking as the MVPs of the game? Man, I hadn't even thought about that for some reason. I'll go DJ Giddens, just keep it rolling. I I think it's a ground game for Kansas State. Especially if it snows, it feels like DJ Giddens' style is probably a little bit more suited for it. Uh, and he and he and Trayshawn you know, Ward both have their moments against KU where they came through, but DJ Gins say, feels like he's in a really good spot. I was gonna say, we're talking about DJ Gins a lot, deservedly so. He's had a great year, he can get over a th- he can go over a thousand this week, I believe. Uh, rushing yards on the season, but and I know he's had some games where lately that haven't been probably gone the way that he wanted, but man, Trayshawn Ward's had some big moments this year, and he probably gets yeah. overlooked a bit. That was it a 54 yard run against KU last week? Mm-hmm. Right after Will Howard almost throws a pick six. That was huge. Yep, big time. Uh, look, for me, I was going to go DJ Giddens as well. 
I just think that's that's the guy that has to come through for you uh, in this type of game if the weather ends up playing out like it's supposed to. Look, we've talked about weather a handful of times this year, and every time it's been brought up, it's been wildly different by the time the game kicked off. But the and, and this forecast is, snow is still pretty locked in. And, and this forecast has shifted a few times already as well, so it, yeah. it could change. Uh, defensively for K State, I don't know because Iowa State doesn't run the ball well, so I, you know, you, you don't really go up front. I just think this is going to come down to, uh, you know, the, the corners had some moments where they broke down against KU, and when KU went back to throw, the the opportunity was there for him. I think you need a big game here because Rocco Beck is going to put it in the air. They've relied on him. He's already got a couple three hundred yard passing games this year, including last week against Texas, um, when even they only scored sixteen points. So I, you know, I put this on a guy like Jacob Parrish or Will Lee to come through for you when the ball is in the air. Make the most of your opportunities and try and lock down Iowa State throwing it because the run game, while it could bust off, you know that that's not been the stereotypical way Iowa State has done things this year. So you need the corners to come through if you're K State. I'll go off the unbeaten path a little bit. I think last week I mentioned how Austin Remain was going to be pretty valuable, and he was, and not really for the right ways because. KU manipulated him pretty well just because of his inexperience. It was Bo Palmer that came through at that inside linebacker spot. Similarly, similarly, that's a tough word. It is this tough week. Word. Uh Damian Ela Leo, I think. Um, now he did, and I just butchered it again. So sorry, Damian, but he did help people how to pronounce his last name this week because he was actually in the press conference room and uh, for the first time uh, as a player answering questions, and he said it's Ela Leo. So he says People make it multiple syllables, not mm. technically correct. Ilalio. So Damien Ilalio, um, I think I think he can play a huge role. He, he continues to get better. He's important. It gets to run because he plays on the interior of the defense. And, you know, who knows? Uh, I don't think we absolutely know, but I think he might be starting this week. Uh, that'll be dictated by the status of Uso Sayamalo, who got injured last week against Kansas. Yeah. Uh, all right. Prediction time. Look, we know that you've got a close one. I've got K State 28 to 13. I don't think they'll put up as, as many points as they have at home this year. I think Iowa State will make it interesting, but uh, I think K State probably wins at 28 to 13. And I just, I think in a game like this, I don't project K State settling for field goals. I think with all the, the different outliers that could come into play, I think it's touchdown or bust when the K State offense is out there. So give me the Cats 28 to 13. Agree with you on the field goal part. Weather, style, pace, rivalry, though, to me, screams tight game. Kansas State wins 21 to 14. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. That's uh, that's what we have to look forward to, and uh, we'll see who ends up being right. The best way to keep track of everything going on with K-State is to follow us over on K-State Online, all the options right there for you to take a look at. And uh, a perfect opportunity to remind everybody that you got a special offer right now. You can get two months of KSO for just $1 right now if you use the code KSU1 at sign up over on On3. So this is a perfect opportunity for either A, somebody that you, you watch or listen to all the YouTube and podcast stuff, but you're not actually uh, on the site and getting all the great info from DY and Drew and great analysis from everybody. Now's the perfect time for you or... I guess $1, you can probably afford that as an early Christmas gift for somebody if you wanted to give it to them. Or you just say, hey, my gift to you is a tip to go get signed up for K-State Online, and they can probably afford a dollar as well. Um, I'm pretty sure even even my three-month-old daughter can can buy uh, two months for a dollar right now. I think she's got enough of that to her name. So good opportunity. Get over to K-State Online. Sign up with code KSU1 if you haven't already for two months at just one dollar a great opportunity and it's just for you guys uh that are watching and listening to the youtube content so that's a big deal uh not, not everybody's getting this just you are so there you have it and uh, we will be ready for k-state and iowa state oh the penguins are making an appearance dy wearing his youngstown yes. state shirt yeah it was that's an ode to my last name it was an ode to my last name so i wore this one this week because you know with the week that I had, that went over KU was just as good for me as it was the, the actual Very wild true. Very true. Uh, we will be back after the game on Saturday with our instant reaction and plenty of coverage from the game itself. Highlights, player, coach, interviews, all of that. And then the Sunday show to recap everything. Uh, we'll also have basketball content that uh, you can check out from last night's game between K-State and Central Arkansas and plenty of other things that include covering the Cats 
the best that we can for all of you at K-State Online. So for Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. Thank you for watching and listening to K-State Online.